have a really, really um, strong belief in um, kind of the importance of safety culture. So I just mentioned uh, talked today to you about a few uh, few aspects of, of safety culture. But you may be wondering what kind of qualifies HSL to uh, to talk in the first place. So we are an executive agency of HSE. So. We basically provide um, HSC with the science that they need to do their job as a regulator. Um, but we don't just do stuff for HSC. I mean, unfortunately, they'd like to give us more money, I'm sure, but we go out and we offer our, our services to, directly to industry as well. So we work with um, quite a few big names. Um, hopefully, some of your logos will be amongst them, <coughs> uh, and hopefully many more in the um, months to come. But um, in the course of the work that we do, we generate a lot of knowledge. And we believe that we have a responsibility to transfer that knowledge back to industry. And we do that in a variety of ways. We don't just kind of, we're not just kind of all boffins creating academic papers. We like to think that we can develop practical solutions that are gonna help um, industry improve their health and safety performance. So we do it in a variety of ways. We do that through maybe a new piece of research through consultancy that we might do for people. But there are some more tangible ways as well in which we work with organisations. So many people come on a training course, for example, at our facility in Buxton, but we're also increasingly developing new products, um, SCT being a really, really good example of that. Um, in order to generate all this knowledge, we have to employ quite a few clever people, so I'm not including myself in that, because compared to some people, I'm a real thicko, believe me. So. Um, but we do have an extremely wide um, variety of disciplines that we cover. Virtually any aspect of health and safety that you can think of will probably have an expert residence at our facility in Buxton. And anybody that's been lucky enough to come to see us in Buxton knows that we uh, we're quite lucky, we have 550 acres of rolling Dutch countryside that we put to good use with some of the uh, dynamic and uh, energetic testing that we do. I'm still yet to see a fight ball that size, but uh, I live in hope. <laughs> um, so in summary about HSL, we look at, at three areas mainly. We look at the health, um, safety and well-being of the individual, so we're concerned with people. We look at the safety of plant and process. But we also look at those human factors that interplay between those two things. And that's where the safety culture thing um, comes into play. So what is safety culture? Well, it's a way of describing the attitudes, the values, the perceptions, the beliefs that an organisation has towards safety that they've probably accumulated over a long period of time. And safety culture um, is typically measured through surveys, questionnaires, that kind of thing. We have something called the safety climate tool, um, and there is a difference between the term safety climate and safety culture that, you know, occupational psychologists um, probably debate about quite uh, strongly, but um, the, they generically recognise that people use the term interchangeably, so, so we're not going to get too hung up about the, the term safety culture and safety climate. And it's funny that you mentioned Chernobyl, I didn't realise that was another string to you though, Simon. <laughs> but um, the, the term safety culture was first used by the International Atomic Energy Authority in the, to describe the issues following the um, incident at Chernobyl, um, those organisational factors. Um, but again, safety culture since then has been used to, um, to describe some of the causes of, of you know, other major incidents, including things like the, um, the fire at Texas City, um, and more recently the, um, the Gulf of Mexico um, incident. More informally, rather than a kind of a, a, a technical definition, people might just say, safety culture is the way we do things around here. Um, other organisations look at safety culture as a way that allows the boss to hear bad news. We're doing a lot of work at the moment with high reliability organisations and for them, hearing bad news is a learning and development opportunity. If they hear the things that are, are going wrong, then at least they can try and do something about them rather than react when something um, happens and it's too late. So why are attitudes so important? Um, well. You know, why, why are things um, like more kind of traditional audits or compliance-based approaches um, more effective? Well, actually, attitudes 
um, are the way that we make sense of the world. world. Our attitudes influence our behaviour and in turn our behaviour influences how effective risk control measures are. And there's an example here of um, a, an organisation that HSL went in to investigate. The, um, their tanker operators, um, there seemed to be a, um, a pattern of um, incidents where tanker uh, operators were falling off the vehicles, um, breaking their legs, breaking their ankles, that kind of thing. And health and safety people just couldn't understand it because they were saying, you know, that the pub's training, we've got all the equipment, they, they know the procedure, <coughs> but why people can keep on, you know, slipping off the tankers while they're having accidents? And then somebody asked the question, well, what's in the tanker? And that tanker contains chlorine. So, it was only by putting yourself into the shoes of the operator and asking the operators, well, actually, you know, what, what is it about the chlorine? Or, you know, what is it that you're scared of? And actually, you know, I'm no chemist, but I know chlorine's pretty nasty stuff. And that was a perception held also by the tanker operator, because they were thinking, well, actually, an accidental release of the chlorine, if I've got a lung full of that, I probably wouldn't come off too well. But actually, if I, if, I could, if I was latched on, I wouldn't be able to escape. So if I don't latch myself on and something happens, <coughs> I can jump off. I'd rather have a broken leg than a lung full of chlorine. And that was, the, that was the, the attitude that they had, and therefore it became the culture not to latch on, not to follow the procedure. And, and they were statistically far more likely to slip, trip, or fall off that tanker than they ever were to be the victim of accidental release, but that didn't matter to them. It was their perception that they would fare um, worse. So that's why attitudes are so <coughs> critical in kind of putting your sh yourself into the shoes of your employees to understand what the real issues are. Another way of thinking, it, you, you might not work in high hazard industry, so you might not have examples that are so obvious in your organization, but if you think about safety culture as, as being, um, if you were having to stop what your organisation did because of a safety issue. That's fair enough if it's a genuine safety issue, but if it was a false alarm, how supported would you feel in your role? So how willing is your organisation to take safety seriously above everything else? So why do companies measure safety uh, climate? Well, safety, climate, uh, safety, health and safety performance might have plateaued. Um, safety climate can also be a proxy um, measure to indicate that you're moving in the right direction. But it also can suggest how ready your organisation is for embarking on any kind of programme um, relating to behavioural safety. You've probably all seen these kind of things before to show that the evolution of safety that reflects that, you know, generally organisations have looked at equipment, they've looked at procedures and systems, they've even looked at some organisational factors, but it's going to show that for many organisations, if they're going to continue to improve, or may, some would argue sustain current levels of health and safety performance, then it's the people and the behaviours that are critical. So, measuring safety culture is not a something that you should do just in isolation. But just by measuring it, it's not going to change anything. But it's going to give you some very, very good data on which to start any kind of program. But there's a lot to think about when you're doing it. It's, like I say, it's not something you can just do in isolation. The data is not going to tell you anything at all unless you kind of interpret it and uh, implement it in, in a system going forward. It's like anything else. Preparation is really, really key to getting it right. Um, essential to the whole process is getting buy-in from your senior management. You might have an organisation that's quite strongly unionised, so getting those people involved. You need to think about kind of the demographics of the organisation, um, also how you might tailor um, your, your question set, or the, the approach that you take. Um, and also you might have to think about things like translations, because we all have very diverse workforces these days, so languages and things like that are increasingly more important. Then there's the actual running of the survey, you know, where do you host it, do you do electronic, do you do paper, um, once you've got your data in, what do you do with that, how are you going to interrogate the data, where do you start, um, 
then once you've got some data, hopefully it reflects your thinking as a health and safety professional. But if it doesn't, it could be that you want to focus in on some areas. So it could be that focus groups and interviews and that kind of thing would be a relevant stage. Once, when you've got your data, you want to do something with it. It's very important to design appropriate interventions. This is the stage where you're wanting to get people engaged in not just giving you the information, but including them in the solution making. Because the more people are in, um, involved in making the um, solutions going forward, the more buy-in that you're going to get, the more likely they're going to follow the procedure that they have to be put into. Um, then obviously at some stage you want to review how well you're doing, so that's another area that you've got to consider. And then obviously at some stage you want to let those things bed down, but then in, in uh, the months to come you'll probably want to review and plan doing it all again so you can <coughs> benchmark and trend where you're going. But, sounds a bit daunting all that, but it's not really. <laughs> and thankfully HSL have got a tool that will help you which will be available for your Cardinus uh, representative. But basically, I mean, HSL, there are, there are probably quite a few tools out there, um, but HSL is probably the only um, commercially available tool that allows you to do it yourself. So um, we've applied, we've taken the science that are based from the original HSC tool. HSC had their own um, climate survey tool out back in 1997, which was retired from the market after about 10 years. Um, we took that and we did a full statistical review of the, the tool. We made it shorter. We made sure that it was a very robust and um, valid tool for measuring safety culture. Um, and we based it around eight key factors. So I won't go through those now because we're, we're short on time. Um, but essentially, those factors help reach a point where you understand what safety culture is within your organisation. And the customers that we've, we've um, been working with have told us on many occasions that not only does running this kind of survey help to raise the profile of health and safety, but it's really helped to get people engaged, to get them excited. If people feel that they're heard, they're very, very um, more likely to be engaged and therefore want to, want to help be part of the solution going forward. Um, a safety um, culture measurement program should not just focus on the negative, it should be a, a chance to look at the things that you actually do quite well. And this is a, one of the benefits of the tool, it actually allows you to give that positive message back. Well actually it's not all bad news, these are the areas where you're responding very, very well. But it does highlight therefore the areas where there is room for improvement and therefore you can more intelligently target your resources to those areas that you know are going to make an improvement. And also, if you're using a, the same, the same um, question set um, time and time again, it allows you to track your, your progress over time. And that's also similar, you're able to uh, track your um, performance against other organisations too. We've got a lot of um, data from all the users of the tool. And we offer a benchmarking service to our customers. That's just an example of a kind of a typical chart that you would get out of the HSL safety climate tool. Very, very visual. You can see the green is good. Um, so it, this is just one particular example chart for the, each of the key factors, but you get lots of charts that zone in on the individual statements mapped around those factors. Um, green being always being good, positive red being negative, and yellow being those areas where actually people are just a little bit uncertain, like they kind of um, add on the side of caution. So those are the typical areas, if you're scoring highly in those areas that you want to maybe focus in on a little bit more. Um, we're improving the tool right now as we speak, incorporating <coughs> a written summary report as well, so that will be available from January onwards. And a, a lot of organisations see benefit of having an overall written summary. We've sold the Safety Climate Tool now, the HSL version, to over 160 various organisations um, from a wide variety of sectors. Um, one of the customers, <coughs> I'm very pleased to say, is the, um, the Olympic, uh, Olympic Delivery Authority. Through working with HSC, um, our tool was <coughs> used to measure safety culture right from the very, very start. Um, 
the, the um, ODA were very keen to mandate use of the tool throughout the Olympic um, construction period. So we were able to get a very rich data source from the Olympic. I mean, they, they did a fantastic job. If anybody knows the details of, of the work that was done on the Olympic Park, you know, it, it, they, they really did um, gold plate um, everything. And we got the data set um, and we mapped that compared to the users that we had. And even from, constru you know, from construction companies who traditionally don't have the best of records, <coughs> their, um, their performance, I mean, the, the upper end of the, the data set, um, it goes to show there that they were, they were outperforming all the other organisations that we had data from. So but they really did get um, things right from the start. We got some very good words as well from um, Lawrence Waterman, who headed to Health and Safety. So I'll, I'll leave you to read that. But I think the thing for me from the Olympics um, was the fact that this is uh, London 2012 was the only modern Olympics that's been constructed without a single fatality. I think that's a really kind of record um, to be proud of um, because that means that every other Olympics. You know, you, you just assume as a health and safety person, people have the right to go home at the end of the day um, safe um, from doing the work that they do. And that means every other um, Olympic so far, unfortunately, somebody lost their life. So, um, so this is an area that, you know, we're proud through the work that we've done with HSE, but it just goes to show that, it, that um, by measuring safety culture, it helps you to understand your performance, where you're going, engage people, and that's a key thing. So. So sorry that I'm whittled through that, but um, if there are any questions, uh, myself, my colleagues from HSL are here today. We'd love to speak to you. Um, I'm sure that Cardinal's crew as well would be delighted to answer any questions regarding the uh, state of climate at all. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you.